Hello, thanks for tuning into this episode. Before we start, Fintech Focus TV is brought to you by Harrington Star, global leaders in financial technology recruitment. Head to the Harrington Star website and check the links below so you can download the latest copy of the Financial Technologies magazine. And also, we've got the TradFi and DeFi Era of Convergence documentary coming up. If you're interested in the merger of the two, please get in touch. Thanks a lot and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am very, very excited. I've been looking forward to this one for weeks. It is Paolo Cerrone from IBM. Paolo, how are you? I'm fine. Thanks, Toby, for hosting me today. Oh, absolutely no problem at all. It's a, it's a real honor. Look, we've got Fintech royalty in the house today. You've been very, very kind to send me this over. Oh. I've, I've, and I've been looking at it, really enjoying it. Paolo's book, new book is out and it is a belter. It's got loads and loads of interesting things that we're going to be talking about today in, in there. And it's things that we've been talking about on this show, excited about on this show for, for ages. So to have you in and, and be able to talk about it is something that I've been very, very excited about. But so before we get into all of that, and there's lots to talk about today, we've got a jam-packed show. Paolo, tell us a little bit about yourself and your, and your background, if you would. Well, I have a mixed background uh, in terms of business. I started uh, in risk management. I was head of quantitative risk management for capital market institutions for almost 15 years. I then became an entrepreneur. I set up a, a small startup in Germany that wanted to transform the well management business, starting from the portfolio optimization engine and leading into different conversations with customers. This small company was bought by IBM in 2013. So I joined IBM, I've been working on the total leadership side for a while. And now I'm the global research leader for the Institute of Business Value, which is um, the Total Leadership Center of IBM for banking and financial markets. So I coordinate uh, the um, banking and financial markets point of views uh, uh, for, uh, for IBM. And at the same time, I'm also um, a prominent author. I've been writing uh, uh, a lot uh, in the last uh, few years uh, uh, during this um, interesting uh, parkour. They moved me from banking to entrepreneurship and into, into technology. I like to say that this is like uh, for those that enjoyed uh, the Divine Comedy of Dante Alighieri, this uh, 1300 masterpiece, uh, that that is like his journey from hell through purgatory into heaven. So <laughs> when I was his manager, I saw all the saints of the financial system and, you know, even those uh, that you haven't seen yet. As an entrepreneur, uh, uh, I had to suffer a lot, uh, um, you know, make many mistakes, uh, things work, things don't work. But then I got into... Uh, the world of uh, exponential technologies, which is some sort of uh, the heaven uh, these days. Uh, however, if I can say what characterizes my professional journey is that I always kept an eye about what really matters for all of us, human beings on a limited planet. And that is well reflected in all my literature. So really try to understand how to build value with technology within the regulatory framework. I think that's the the critical part here, isn't it? And this is what I was so interested about with the, with the book, and is that you know technology is obviously seen as this uh, this savior. You, you you mentioned it in the heaven world and in, in in that example. But I think there's, there's there's been a sort of education over recent years where where from being you know, everything's got to be tech and we, you know, we're in a digital revolution and and uh, we've got instant accessibility and we're looking for all of these different benefits. But there's been a lot of tech for tech's sake. And I think what's really interesting is, is where people are looking at, at saying, well, we've got some really, really clever technology. It's going to do all that sort of stuff, but it doesn't solve a problem that needs to be solved. And I love this. I mentioned to you earlier on, I think that, you know, this, this sort of first phraseology on the back of the book here talks about friction remains the biggest hindrance to bank revenue and viability over the next decade. And this is where I think, you know, technology led experiences, that, as you're talking about there, aren't just for the sake of technology, they're to solve real problems in, in, in the space. Tell me about your view of tech within finance and, and what it can do and where, where some of the, the pitfalls are and what we're seeing at the moment. Where are we in the cycle? And, and, and so you know, First of all, let me tell you that, uh, this latest bestseller, <clears throat> Bank and Tech on Platinum Economies, uh, uh, is uh, a journey for the readers uh, to understand uh, not only the lessons learned in the last mm -hmm. 10 years of the many mistakes were made there we need to discuss why but also is a look at what happens today and what happen in the future in terms of uh, the strategies 
that would allow fintech and banks uh, to box out from today's constraint environment uh, and basically be capable of being uh, sustainable and generate more value on the fourth industrial revolution. And, and these strategies are called contextual banking and conscious banking. Maybe we will have a time to present them because it mm. will help uh, the audience to understand what is needed. Please do. Far, far uh, away. Is a competence, right, and knowledge to support this transformation. But first of all, what matters to me is the following. I have been traveling extensively in the last years. Sometimes I was going uh, east and coming back west in just one week. And I've been meeting thousands of uh, fintech entrepreneurs, a lot of clients, uh, so many bread colleagues uh, uh, from IBM. I think that we can divide the world uh, into three macro areas uh, without wanting to forget anybody. Let's say that digital technology is a produce of uh, the United States of America, the Silicon Valley. That's where a lot of uh, technology uh, has been born recently. Uh, we might admit that uh, China is becoming extremely competitive, right? But largely mm -hmm. speaking, let's go back 15 years ago. That's where it started. Europe is where a uh, lot of regulation is born, and that's also important. The European uh, Commission has the interest to harmonize uh, the capital market union, but also to protect uh, the final consumer and investor for the good and for the bad. The regulation is never perfect, but it is extremely important. But if you like the winners uh, or the, those that benefited the most so far from uh, fintech innovation uh, live uh, in uh, Asia Pacific, in particular in China and in India, because there the business models are born. So now mm. what I'm trying to do in my work uh, and what I also do in my literature is uh, to start from the business model. That is a starting point, it's not technology. Knowing okay. that uh, what works uh, in China doesn't necessarily work in Bavaria, Germany, or in mm. Ontario, Canada. Then look at the technology that is available today, reminding us that not all of the exponential technologies are at the same level of maturity. For example, what we can do with AI today, we couldn't do five years ago. Mm. What we do with quantum today is a fraction of what we might do five years from now. Yeah, but exactly. then keep everything inside a, a regulatory framework and the regulatory frameworks are not equal around the globe, but that makes sure that uh, we not just strive for disruption, but we look for sustained innovation, something that effectively transforms for the good for everybody in the ecosystem, the environment uh, that we're working in. So with that in mind, uh, uh, I always try to make sure that when we discuss technology, we don't do it for the sake of technology, but mm. for the problem that effectively needs to be resolved and that enables us to understand that what is the time to shift to a new paradigm from a technology perspective or maybe not right or have a, a mild or a more compromised perspective so with regards to that i 100 agree i think you know when when i look at entrepreneurs and and we've had hundreds of them on this, this show over the last uh, last three four years or so the ones who really impress me are the ones who, who as you say are problem-led business problem led as opposed to technology led that so looking at points of friction in the system they're looking at inefficiencies they're looking at optimization they're looking at productivity all of those key words that people are looking for to invest in and they're thinking right how do we provide and present a solution utilizing the technology that, that's out there to create the route the route further forward so when you look at that and you're looking at the uh the, you know, the banking system and i think you know as you say in the book on numerous occasions with platform economies and such like, and, and where the, the shift is across the industry at the moment, where do you see the biggest points of friction? Where do you see the biggest opportunities here that, that technologies can uh, can come in? I know it's a big question to throw at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, for those that we left China and those that already had the time to read uh, this, uh, this book, the core is uh, called the Banking Invention Quadrant. And uh, as every quadrant has two dimensions, one is uh, called information, and the other one is called communication. And information and communication has been identified by the researchers of uh, the European Central Bank in an interesting paper appeared a few years ago titled uh, uh, Financial Intermediation with Technology, What's Old, What's New? Uh, as they said that uh, financial institutions of fintech can excel if they intensify the information quotient and the communication quotient. So now, what does this mean in practice uh, in terms of uh, uh, transforming, making sure you grab uh, the next opportunity to generate value for customers and for uh, your shareholders? Well, first of all, uh, intensifying the information quotient means uh, learning how to move from uh, the legacy 
infrastructure into an open ecosystem that is supported by sharing data securely on every cloud technology. Okay, it's really a process of opening up so that you blur uh, the barriers uh, in between the business units and you blur uh, the industry definitions between you and uh, the other industries to enter into an open banking, open finance, and potentially an open data perspective. That is uh, foundational. And uh, as you excel into the information quotient, what basically happens is that uh, you build some sort of a banking as a service infrastructure where you leverage uh, your uh, banking uh, competence, uh, capabilities, uh, in order to eliminate the friction in external ecosystems. So basically, you insert yourself this way, you embed yourself into another ecosystem. And that is the biggest value that uh, you can build with the so-called contextual banking uh, platform strategy. Of course, nothing is uh, simple. And in particular, what matters is to understand is that uh, as the role of the bank will become in an open ecosystem to eliminate the friction from another journey. Just imagine the one click when you're on Amazon, right? You, mm. you use a banking product or capability, but you do it within your purchasing journey. The customers at some point assume that once the friction is eliminated, is eliminated, so you don't have to pay for something that is not there, right? So yeah. that is pushing financial institutions to be more proactive in interacting with those ecosystems and some even to build ecosystem platforms in order to own a different perspective in the economy to make sure that then they can plug in themselves much better and have uh, still a role in front of uh, the final consumers, but uh, mediated by a platform strategy, so mediated by an ecosystem perspective. So it's not a linear chain like a distribution channel of products, and that's it. On the other side, we have communication. And communication is basically the human interface, typically, which might be getting more and more transformed. I wouldn't say replaced, I like to say transformed, by the leveraging of artificial intelligence. And so that's basically when uh, you, you, you have a shift from product selling to a data-driven distribution where you try to be more precise in mapping products and clients, but that will never be enough. You get into intelligent, uh, transparent advisory processes. So you see a shift of the revenues from the products, which are more and more commoditized because of interest rates, because of passive investing, because of regulation and simplification of derivatives, and so on and so forth, into a framework where the customer will have to pay for accessing the platform, which becomes an advisory platform. And mm -hmm. therefore, you need to have the data that you created by intensifying information quotient and the capability that you build with artificial intelligence to enable those clients which are self-directed to operate by themselves and those clients and there are many that will never be or will not easily be self-directed to talk to an intermediary person that is supported so that they can provide advice to more people for lower cost because they can be assisted in the process by exponential technologies like artificial intelligence. So now you have already hybrid cloud and data, you have artificial intelligence and human relationships at Excel, and in between you have a, a variety of things. For example, you can think about the blockchain. The blockchain still should be about transparency in the process, so how you use the data in order to deliver an information and trust for to someone to make a decision, right? And you can map on this quadrant the business model transformation of your institution. So you decide, do I want to embed myself into an ecosystem where that's contextual banking. That means that uh, you unlock new value by eliminating the friction. And that value is uh, the capability of an ecosystem to operate in a different way. Or you decide that uh, you want to be a conscious banking type of uh, institution. That means you see the shift from products to advisory relationships so that you use exponential technologies to unlock hidden value, which is inside the relationship, which is buried upon a stratification of practices. But now with the leveraging uh, uh, of uh, transparency in the positioning of communication with clients, uh, you can ask clients to pay differently from those services. Nothing is easy, but some institutions are doing that on both sides uh, around the world and others are trying to converge at some point in the two. So that's what makes me particularly excited about these times because I see that people are realizing that effectively these will be the two major directions to rebound their financial services on the platform economy. 
I think it's really, really interesting, isn't it? And a lot of you, you mentioned earlier on Amazon and you know the whole one-click sort of sort of play. And I think I've been preaching for some time that, that finance often sits a, a long way behind retail uh, and e-commerce in terms of how it's adapted to technology and, and reduced it. So you talk about Amazon's one-click, but also their use of their transformational use of AI, their use of data, their their repositioning, their targeting, their ability to make things easier for the consumer in every single aspect has been a relentless drive. And my frustration, I think, about the financial services market, particularly in capital markets, has been a sort of uh, um, you know, paralysis around certain levels of, of innovation. And I, and I think it took the pandemic, for example, you know, to really build the trust and the necessity more than, more than anything else to allow cloud technology to really improve processes within the markets because everyone's terrified, aren't they, about the, uh, the power of legacy systems and its difficulty to be able to, to innovate and, and improve. And and I think you're right. This is an exciting stage to, to be able to learn from like, companies like uh, Amazon and learn from e-commerce. Yes, but we need to redefine some uh, some concepts uh, if we really want to make it happen. And uh, I'm always cautious to make uh, straight comparisons between e-commerce uh, and banking and financial markets because the client is in principle the same, but it's like we have two different psychology. One thing is uh, buying a Gucci bag, another one is making a financial decision like investing uh, in a, a multi asset. Investment That's fund. Fine. But now I want to explain uh, something that to me is foundational, as you talked about uh, trust, uh, uh, the accelerated digitalization, so the adaptation of consumers, the need to consume more and more on digital, which can be a problem for many that still are at odds uh, with making financial decisions. And, and I do that with an example, which is a personal entrepreneurial example, and also an example of what I learned from Jeff Bezos, which if you like, it goes beyond uh, what we've been hearing a lot uh, in the fintech ecosystem about uh, leveraging data and uh, data-driven banking and so forth. So there's something more foundational we need to start from that unlocks the value of everything else. So now you you are my age, it seems. Huh? So mm -hmm. I'm 52. And um, in the 1990s, uh, when uh, Amazon was born, you might remember that uh, Jeff Bezos was primarily selling books. Yeah. And, uh, uh, my brother, while I was working in uh, uh, capital markets, uh, uh, decided to launch a startup. I was helping him with the idea that uh, we could become the Amazon of Italy. How, how good yeah. is that? So we thought <laughs> we have at our disposal the best of the products in the world. Sorry for the others. Fashion, food, furniture, and travel. <laughs> we had this leap by design, and we thought we are going to make it happen, right? It's going to be a huge, huge hit. We didn't sell much. We really didn't sell much. <laughs> so now, you see, we made many mistakes. But I think that uh, the one that matters to me, I learned a few years after listening to a Jeff Bezos interview, when the journalist asked Jeff Bezos, um, what's Amazon? And Jeff Bezos said, um, Amazon is not a distribution channel of books uh, on the internet. And I was frowning, like, it is not. It's, it's selling products, right? Books. Yeah. And he said, let me explain why. He said, uh, these days, uh, the publishers uh, are complaining with me, he said, because they say I don't understand marketing now called Jeff Bezos stupid. <laughs> 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 because they say that. At that, um, that I, age, well. <laughs> exactly. So he said that I post positive and negative reviews. And they say that I should only post the positive reviews of the books uh, because it's marketing so they can sell more but then he continued they are wrong because they are not my client yes. he said my client is uh, the user so people like me and you Toby, right and he goes uh, and uh, what happens here is that a uh, lot of users come to the platform to amazon but they're not making transactions because they don't touch the book you know when i have a new book I smell the glue all the time. I want to see it, right? I turn, flip over, and maybe I ask uh, the person in uh, the bookshop for an opinion, but that cannot happen, right? So it's a different experience. So he said that positive and negative reviews are the mechanism of transparency that unlock trust so that mm. people trust to make the transaction and they move forward. Mm. So then he said that only after I use other analytics, only after, in order to propose something else to the client, right? To move the client around. So you see data enabling the client in essence precedes uh, 
uh, data-driven uh, platforms or data-driven banking in this case. So the question is, if Amazon was not, in essence, when it started, uh, the essence, a distribution channel of products on the internet, can a fintech mm. or a bank be a distribution channel of products on mobile? Not really. Mm. I mean, in the end, you will have products, but the starting point, the real problem that you need to resolve um, is how to allow those consumers out there uh, to onboard in a way that they are comfortable and they trust uh, then what they make uh, makes sense uh, and you know that's way more complicated for banks because when you buy something on amazon and you don't like it you can return it but if you invest in investment fund and then you lose 10 percent the week after you cannot give it back right so yeah. i understand that for bankers and fintech uh, it's a bit more complex but that's why i have uh, research and literature to help understand how to crack the code that's exactly where it comes in and where you, where, where the help the help does it. I think it's really interesting you talk there about data as well because you know it's it's sort of flipping the narrative a little bit around what you know how you can re re you know, realistically use data to the best of its ability. And I think you know, in financial services again, data for me is something there which has caused an element of of confusion. Everyone knows they have to have it on the agenda, but I'm not 100 percent sure people are pushing it into the right really? are arena. I think that's improving. But again, it's the you story see, behind the data, in, in my opinion. We, me we mentioned the platform economy in the fourth industrial revolution. One of the key uh, elements uh, of the transformation is a shift from the output economy to the mm. outcome economy. Output mm. means uh, selling individual quantities and, and optimizing that one. Outcome means uh, selling a client journeys and being paid for the experience and doing the journey. That is essential and, and needs to be basically addressed and, uh, and resolved. And, uh, and here is where basically you have the biggest uh, complexity because the outcome economy contradicts the existing business model of an institution. So many people, when they talk about client journeys, uh, they they say, oh, we are client-centric, but in reality, they put the client at the center of a marketing campaign. That mm. is still out, or output economy. It's not outcome economy. Outcome mm. economy is, is making uh, clients enabled to consume by themselves uh, and pay for accessing the platform. The product will be there, but the power between the product and the cost for accessing the platform is basically rebalancing and is shifting towards the all-in pricing, so the fee-based approach and principle. Now, if you don't understand the difference between the one and the other, you will not be able to plug in technology so that you use data in a way that you facilitate mm. where the real friction is in the end, which is the pull and push motivational gaps or the difficulty of many people to sell direct themselves. So, if the industry now is a push-driven industry, uh, largely speaking, so it pushes products to people and typically it uses uh, human relationships. And now you have the mobile that doesn't have the relationship. Either you enable clients to be capable of pulling by themselves yeah. <laughs> or you basically are uh, in between, right? So the biggest friction really is enabling people fairly and transparently, so you should not be biased, to be conscious in making financial decisions for their own benefit. This is really, really interesting, isn't it? Because it's such a sea change of opportunity that we're, that we're presented with right now. What do you see happening? I mean, we've talked a little bit about past and where we're sat in the present, the heaven, as you spoke about earlier on, of what technology and, and this can do. Um, I've been reading a lot about the membership economy that sort of goes in with this, where, where you know, the likes of uh, Amazon and Netflix and such like have, have taken that in the outside world. What, does, what, what, do, what do we can expect to see in the future of, of banking and technology? Where's the real opportunity right now? Well, banking is a variety industry, first of all, right? Uh, so it's not just one type of uh, um, framework. Uh, um, so you have asset managers, uh, is, you have uh, retail bankers, private bankers, you have corporate bankers, but more or less, uh, they are all leading to the same direction. So they either needed to unlock new value for clients uh, or unlock hidden value in the relationship with clients in order to justify the work uh, that basically they are doing. In this process, uh, whether you move uh, more into intensified information or communication, so contextual banking, uh, embedding yourself a conscious banking, becoming uh, totally transparent, uh, what happens is that uh, the products that are on display uh, reduce uh, progressively their capability to generate margins. And this is a process that started uh, many years ago at the height of the global financial crisis. Uh, 
Uh, if you compare uh, uh, today world with 2007, it's very different. Interest rate uh, became very low to negative. Yes, now they're catching up a bit, but still mm. much lower compared to the past. And then you've got inflation that, uh, that buys your lunch anyway. Then you have passive investing, uh, then you have uh, uh, simple derivatives. You don't have all of those complex transactions that you had in the past. So the capability to embed fees in products is more and more limited. And there's just as much you can do in terms of volumes, right? Because mm. your claim is in the end, as large as it is, but it is limited. So what is happening is that whether you are a corporate banker or a retail banker or a private banker, you're trying to shift the attention and your, your, your effort in a way that the clients will pay for accessing your capabilities. Of course, when it is a retail client, it will be more technology oriented and simplified. When it is a high net worth individual, there will be more relationship like them where it matters, where they can spend more time and so on and so forth, right? So there's a there's an intensity that changes according to, in a sense, the segment, but it's just how much, how much technology, about how much technology you want to, to plug in. And, and that is basically the, the real shift that, that needs to happen. But for that really to happen, as we said that the products are still there, but not at the core of everything, you need to flip the organization from verticals, which are around products, into an horizon of perspective, which is really client-driven. And I can give you an example for you to understand that, that mm. also explains to those people working in technology or in business strategy, what is really the problem in transforming from vertical to horizontal. We can compare two industries, as you mentioned, the membership economy, uh, automotive and banking. Um, again, we stretch a bit the concept, but to make it simple. <laughs> so you can think about uh, the automotive industry. Um, is uh, a linear industry, typically. You've got the manufacturers, uh, right? Uh, you have uh, the intermediaries, those that assemble the products, so the, the car makers, and then you have uh, the car dealers that basically sell it, right? Now, um, if you are a client, according to your level of wealth, uh, you can hyper-personalize the car you buy. So maybe you want to get uh, the special navy system or a Tiptronic or uh, an artisan that you, you, you know is good to make the leather set of your fancy car, right? But in the end, what happens is that you don't make deals uh, with all of these makers, right? You don't buy these products disjointly. You have an all-in price in front of the car dealer, you walk out with a car and you go from A to B, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to banking, um, the process is similar because the industry is still a linear industry. You've got the manufacturers, like those that make the investment products, those that make uh, the, 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 the bank accounts and so on and so forth. Um, but what happens is that um, in order to, to do your journey, you need all of them, right? But at different points in time, sometimes overlapping. So you need a bank account or maybe not if you have a FinTech solution, you need the payment method, maybe it's a credit card or a digital wallet. You may need to invest some money, maybe directly with a robot advisor. And you may need to save money for retirement or insure uh, uh, your, uh, your kids' education. So you do all of this, but if you like, you will never be satisfied by having only one and not the others. In general, you need the, the portfolio of all of those, right? Mm. But banks tend to sell to you these products at this jointly through different business units uh, with different people and relationships. And it, there's always a new New York customer, right? Uh, even within the same uh, banking group. Now, that would be like uh, buying a car uh, without steering wheel. You cannot use mm. it, right? So mm. in the end, the value is when you have everything. So that means that banks need to learn how to sell your relationship that contains these various opportunities that you can draw the moment you need them, right? Where the product is still important, but then in essence, that would it pays the all-in pricing for that important relationship. And why does this matter? It matters because we are actually moving from the asset economy to the membership economy, right? Mm -hmm. So again, an example with automotive, the automaker, the automotive companies also learn that not only they can decide uh, how many cars they want to sell to a client, uh, but they now learned that uh, they can resolve the same problem with car sharing. Mm. So basically, they still produce the car, but the client doesn't buy the car. The car buys the real need, which is using a car to go from A to B by himself or by herself. And now what happens is that as the client doesn't buy the car, the client uh, can judge uh, the experience much more. So if, if they don't like that experience, they just switch to another app and the client is lost. So you really need to excel in delivering that experience because the client pays for accessing basically that platform. 
Now, when it comes to banking, it's the same. Banks have been used to sell financial products. We said, unbundle this jointly with different streams, like selling 1 billion as an under management of an investment fund. What now they need to focus on is uh, helping their customers to fulfill their goals, being a family, individuals, uh, or uh, corporate clients uh, in their journey from going from A to B, which might require an intensity of products, uh, which is, uh, uh, if you like, uh, bundled differently according to their stages in life uh, and their new priorities. And that is an advisor relationship, or if you like, uh, is contextualizing inside uh, a different journey where they focus on one of these journeys specifically, but you just use banking to eliminate the friction. That transforms uh, the monetization from products, which still have uh, some capacity to generate uh, margins into the membership. So the relationship is not easy, but that is the essence of uh, the platform economy, so the fourth industrial revolution. So we need to understand uh, the gaps, uh, the problems, and also the opportunities by thinking this way. It's incredibly exciting and brilliantly put that. I think I think it sort of demystifies everything that we're, we're thinking about within it. And it does just present this sort of overwhelming sensation of opportunity that sits there at the moment to do things better and to, to, you know, to drive things further forward and make it you know, as you know, personalized and opportunistic and, and everything in between for the, for the end user. Right? I guess most in the audience have learned and tried for the last 10 years uh, to unbundle banks, right? So to focus on uh, um, very, if you like, a simple-minded uh, uh, business opportunities uh, to optimize and excel using technology. But I've been meeting so many uh, entrepreneurs around the world, and I always told them the following, uh, you cannot break banks for the simple reason that banks are already broken because they work mm -hmm. this junkie. So as you need to think platform economy, you need to learn how to bundle things back. But if you don't start your entrepreneurial journey by understanding there is the bundling that will unlock the most of the value, you might misconfigure a platform, you might not use technology the right way, you don't build a data fabric uh, in a consistent form, you don't have the fabric that you need, you're not open as much as you should, so on and so forth, right? So mm. that is another suggestion I give our audience to learn that bundling uh, something broken is more important than optimizing broken pieces. I love that, I love that. As, as I predicted, this has been one of the fastest half hours I've ever spent, <laughs> where it's just uh, time has disappeared uh, on us uh, incredibly quickly because of the fascinating content on it. But I want to finish on on this because I think it's uh, it's so imperative for people to pick up a copy and, and do it. And I presume, speaking of Amazon, that that's where they can uh, best go to, uh, to to pick all that that sort of stuff up from as well. But just before before we finish up, uh, Paolo, Talk to me about if people are reading this. What what should be the main lesson that they take away from it? What what do you what do you, when you wrote the book? What were you hoping would be the principal thing that people would take away? I think we need to get a different understanding of the human being. We've been telling each other things which are not very relevant. A lot of assumptions on how people want effectively to consume financial services. So in this book, we are rediscovering. I, I call them the biological macro foundations of the, the Homo sapiens, which is uh, our real motivation that uh, dealing with money reveals it because money is about survival. Okay, mm. money is about uh, planning something uh, over time. And by doing that, uh, you will see that all the other pieces come together in terms of what technology is really for. So we define what value is for humans on a planet of limited resources, and then we understand what technology can do to basically make that happen, improve it, or uh, uh, protect it. The other way around, that will never work. So the future of humanity relies on reading the book, is what I've heard from, uh, from that. <laughs> 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 there's, there's, there's your strap line. Emmanuel F. Severino, which is a humongous philosopher, that is just the part that I would talk about the potency of uh, technology and its collapse. Yes, we try to avoid it. <laughs> Listen, I love that. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, having you on the show. Thanks so much for sharing the, the wisdom. Uh, thanks for writing the book as well and, and for, for coming on to this. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I want to do more of these. Um, I'm, I'm desperate to have you back on again. Uh, and we're going to make this a bit of a feature if you're, if you're up for it. Um, I'd love to have you back on. And, I'm and, always uh, delighted unpack a little bit more. with the audience. Good man. Paolo, it's been lovely speaking to you. If people want to get in touch and find out a little bit more, obviously they can read the book. But what's the best way to get in touch with you? 
Um, well, social media is always uh, the best way, very active on LinkedIn or uh, uh, Twitter. My handle is always the same, the piece Roni is like the Financial Times. They can there also follow Breaking Banks Europe. I'm a co-host of uh, the European edition. It's the most important fintech podcast uh, uh, worldwide or can reach out through the IBM channels uh, uh, be uh, available to, 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 to discuss and to conversate business opportunities follow it up it is well worth it Paolo it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for getting involved and, and coming on today and we will see you very soon I hope okay ciao ciao for now thank you all for watching we will see you soon on another episode of FinTech Focus TV thank you <laughs>